So, hey, saints, it's Sister with a Testimony and Sister with a Testimony Church Chat Granny. And today we are going to be talking about mysticism, Christian mysticism, and um, basically what you should know about mysticism. And um, I chose the title of this, uh, Sister G. Uh, it says, um, Mysticism and Christendom mixed up. What do you think about that? You said that? I said um, mysticism and Christendom mixed up. <coughs> I like that. That's good. I just, I put Christian dumb. <laughs> Chris, Christian dumb, huh? Okay. Yeah, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go there, but that is funny. So, yeah. let me read uh, an excerpt from an article I found about mysticism from Sam Storms. And um, mysticism is an approach to Christianity that focuses on preparation. Now, mind you, listen to this. For consciousness of and reaction to what can be described as the immediate or direct presence of God. Now, think about that. An approach to Christianity that focuses on preparation for consciousness of and reaction to what can be described as the immediate or direct presence of God. The emphasis is placed on the subjective or felt experience of being in an intimate relationship with God. And some mystics refer to it as a spiritual ecstasy. The earthly goal of this relationship is personal, ethical, and spiritual transformation. The heavenly culmination of which is the, um, I guess, the beatific, be beautific vision. Now think, think about that. It's a feeling. Um, the last time I looked, our faith is supposed to be an action, not a feeling. So when you're talking about mysticism... And how its approach to Christianity basically affects us today in the church. There should be some key words here and some clues here for you. Are you there? Yeah, I'm listening. All right. So there's a there's basically there's a lot of new age mysticism stuff going on out there, and it's uh, prevalent in the church today. Uh, there's been a variety of expressions of mysticism in the history of the church and uh, it makes it kind of difficult to identify a singular stream or even a set of characteristics but there are several features of most forms of mysticism so it's kind of interesting uh, that there is typically now this is this is the, here's your clue right here if you know anything about the Word of God if you seriously have any idea what the Word of God says, you're going to be able to pick this apart. There is typically an emphasis on experience of union with God, which generally assumes one of two forms, a relational or ethical union conceived as a union of wills, and some say spirits, or a union of love. Hmm. Yeah, there you go. There you go, right here. Also, an essential union, it could be described as absorption into God to such a degree that personal identity is in some sense lost. Okay, so we could stop right there, get many, many scriptures, and just tear this apart. But let's move on to number two. Ten things that we really need to know about mysticism and Christendom being mixed up. Most forms of mysticism highlight contemplation of God. If you're taking notes, write that down. Contemplation of God that both flows from and leads to a deeper personal intimacy. And um, this Sam Storm states that Teresa of Avila teaches that as one progresses in contemplation, 
there is a suspension of the faculties. Uh, in other words, in mysticism, there's an end to the ordinary operation of the intellect whereby we think, reason, formulate, etc. And at this point, God sovereignly infuses a transrational awareness of himself. Well, you know, I, I know this is, for me, this is absolutely ridiculous, but you need to know about it. It says that God infuses a transrational awareness of himself called a divinely bestowed absorption in knowing and loving and seeking. I'm like, uh, no, that's new age. It's definitely new age. Interesting? Yes, yes. Number three, the so-called uh, beautiful vision of God, or the, the word uh, B-E-A-T-I-F-I-C. Beautific vision of God is the goal of virtually all forms of mysticism. Now think about that. What I can see, sense, taste, smell, the senses... It's the consummation of the mystic's earthly experience and growth. It is the, now listen to this, face-to-face -face encounter with God that will come in heaven. Again, my question would be, what do you need Jesus for if you can just have God face-to-face -face right now? Well, where's that lead Jesus? Let's look at first, I'm going to look at, I'm going to take you to 1 John chapter 3 verse 2, okay? 1 John chapter 3 verse 2. You know we love 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 reads on this wise. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Wow. 1 John 3, 2. How about Revelation 22, 4? Revelation 22, 4. Because you can always pick out scriptures and, and back up what you're trying to teach. But you've got to know more than just one scripture. Revelation 22, 4. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Ah, if that's in Revelation chapter 22, that's at a later date. That's not here on earth, is it? Revelation 22, 4. And they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. Yeah, okay. Well, let's keep going. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. How mixed up is it, saints, to put Christendom, Christianity... Faith in the one true living God, Yahushua Hamashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, next to mysticism. Uh, this, is, this is the problem with the church today. People do not want a foundation. They want a formula. They want the fruit. They want the formula to get the fruit so that yeah. they don't have to have a foundation. Right. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8 Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 reads on this wise. Blessed, blessed, or happy are those that are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Absolutely, we shall see God. We need to look more and more like him so that people see God in us instead of trying to, you know, go after some mystic. Hmm. Woo! How about number four? Check this out. Ten, ten things you really need to know about mysticism and why it's so mixed up when you put it in a bowl with Christendom and Christianity. Now listen to this. This is, this is crazy. Deification or divinization of the human soul is also a central feature in most forms of mysticism. In other words, it's steeped in the spirit of divination. Occult, hidden. However, most defenders of the mystics, and oh, believe me, honey, they're out there. Just start naming them off. Most okay. defenders of the mystics insist that this transformation into the divine is not to be thought of as a pantheistic sense that God and the human individual remain ontologically distinct. Yeah, right. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, why don't we just start hypnotizing people? 
You with yes. me? Yeah. Yes. It would be no different. It would be no different. Number five. Now, check this out. You ready for this? Yeah. Yeah. Mystics often use vivid terminology to describe the experience of spiritual ecstasy or rapture. Also referred to as enthralling immersion in God. I don't know what God they're talking about, but it is not the God, Yahuwah, Yahushua Hamashiach. I'm serious. I, I want to laugh doing this. It's like, their sublime, sublime perception of God, spiritual inebriation, infused love, absorption, absorption in the beloved, the divine inflowing. Did they not realize they're actually talking about Kundalini? Did you say the divine is flowing? In in flowing, divine inflowing. Oh, inflowing. Yeah, Teresa of Avila um, describes it as a glorious foolishness. Now, I love that. A glorious foolishness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A heavenly madness being bewildered and inebriated in God's love. Such ecstasy rarely lasts for more than an hour. Oh, what do you mean? You feel this feeling in your flesh for an hour, and then guess what happens? You're oh. right back in your sin and your pigsty. Oh, it definitely. Yeah. It, it's always indelible and unforgettable. With this experience, one's inner life of loving and knowing is so intensified that sense perception of the external world is proportionately diminished, often altogether obscured. Now, check this out. Your spiritual experience, your intensified knowing and loving, causes your perception of the external world to be dis dis dismissed or diminished. Say that again. <laughs> say that again. I'll say that again. Uh, such ecstasy rarely lasts for more than an hour, but is always indel indelible and unforgettable. With the experience, one's inner life of loving and knowing is so intensified that sense perception of the external world is proportionately dis diminished and often altogether obscured. In other words, you're out of your mind. The external world doesn't matter. You're just, they're going to tell you that you're in heaven with God, but you're actually in your own mind. According to Colossians chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, run, get your hat and run. One lady's like, get your hat and run. You better get everything and run. Don't leave none of you behind because guess what? <laughs> you are possessed and it ain't by the Holy Spirit either. Ruach HaKadosh. It's a spirit. Are you with me? Yes, I'm listening. I'm just, I'm just trying to... It's crazy. It is, and I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to clear my mind so I can emphasize on each of the words that you, you're speaking. Read Colossians 2, verse um, 18 and 19 for us. Okay. And the cat... And my, my Bible says freedom, freedom from improper worship. Freedom from improper worship. Hallelujah. See, we're on the right track. Yes. Let, let no one default you of your reward, taking delight in false loyalty and worship of angels, intruding to these things which he has not seen vainly, puffed up Verse 18, Colossians 2, 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward. Don't let them trick you out of your reward. 
in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Literally, they're intruding into those things which they have not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So you're talking about mysticism and Christendom. And if you have any understanding of what is holy and what is profane, you're going to understand that mysticism is not holy. It is not holy. No. It's coming from someone's fleshly mind. Uh, number six. Uh, mystics would often speak, and they still do today, saints, of visionary experiences of angels, saints, and especially the Virgin Mary. However, many of the mystics insist that God's indwelling presence is evidenced not by visions, but by his prompting virtuous actions within us. Some mystics, such as Teresa of Vila, also speak of transport of the soul, which is outer body experiences, out of the body experiences, and levitation of the body. This is divination. If God wants to take you out of your body and do something with you like he did some of the folks in the Bible, fine. But you're not supposed to be going after those experiences. You have the Holy Spirit. He indwells you. This is not God we're talking about here. This is the God of this world and the God of your mind. Levitation, soul transport mysticism and Christianity and Christendom today is mixed up and people are falling for it hook, line, and sinker because it feels good to that flesh it feels good um, Todd Bentley in one of his posts he said that it was like um, I don't even want to say the word but when this hot liquid flows through you it is like a experience that is sensual i don't even want to talk about it but when you're dealing with these people that are saying that they're having these feelings and their body feels so wonderful they are having kundalini awakenings and they're saying it's the holy ghost and that that is evil it is wrong and somebody is going to either have to repent or they're going to die and go to hell. It's just that simple. You yeah. can't have Kundalini. Call him Ruach Hakadesh, the spirit of holiness. And you're going to live any old way you want to? No. And um, now, now, I personally, the reason I threw that name out there is because I read the article. I have a copy of it. And I'm like, there are many, many, many people out there that are saying they're Christians that are having these experiences, and they're going to guarantee you that it's God. It is God. It's the God of this world. Hi. Holy and the profane. What's the difference between the holy and the profane? How do you mix yeah. Christianity and mysticism and come up with something holy? You can't. Yeah. Now, among, among the spiritual disciplines practiced by mystics, two in particular are common. The first is solitude. External separation from the world was designed to facilitate internal separation from sin. However, some mystics would differentiate between solitude, which they define as being alone with the alone, and isolation, which is a deliberate distancing of oneself from all human interaction. Oh my gosh, we just stumbled on something, Sister G. Uh -huh. I didn't stumble onto it, I promise you. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And I can guarantee you, Sister, I didn't stumble on this. Uh -uh. Alright, I'm going to say that again. A deliberate distancing of oneself from all human interaction. Social distancing. Exactly. Deliberate distancing of oneself. Now, yeah. in mysticism, it's all human interaction. Um, you know, you're so much better than everybody else that you don't have to interact with anybody. Wow. 
let's just teach the masses how they can become one with this spirit. We can control everyone because, hey, guess what? They're being what? Programmed? Yes. Yes, mysticism will program you. Second yeah. is silence. Since God lies beyond, beyond human expression, any attempt at naming him is doomed to failure. Silence was viewed as a remedy for sinful uses of the tongue. It was a form of attentiveness to God, quiet recollection, recollection and rest in God, and the inevitable consequence of religious awe. Oh, you know, um, people are a little mixed up for sure. Among virtually all mystics, there is considerable emphasis on introspection or concern with monitoring and being in touch with the moral state and spiritual progress of one's soul. I personally will look at myself, I'll repent, I'll stay in that place of, okay, I want to make sure that I'm doing what I should be doing, but I can't do it on my own. It has to be with the Holy Spirit. But if introspection uh, becomes oh, my soul is progressing, then you've gotten out of your relationship with Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Ruach HaKodesh living in you, and you've become um, more interested in your, in your soul. Because I can tell you, your soul is the one that wants these feelings of ecstasy. Your, your spirit man and your soul are two different things. It's like, oh my gosh, um, they emphasize physical... Ascetism, voluntary, voluntarily depriving the body of food and drink, normal conveniences and comfort, sleep is kept to a minimum, the mystic would sleep on the ground or slabs of wood, yeah, well, we know most Christians aren't going to do that, they're just going to go to a certain point, because, um, oh, I'm not going to do whatever it takes and sleep wherever I got to and eat whatever I got to, which is some sort of, um, hey... That's a good thing sometimes, but not every single day and every moment of your life. So, oh, now check this out. Self-scourging was a common uh, other form of self-inflicted bodily pain. This sounds like the prophets of Baal, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. You say, say that again about self-inflicting pain. Self like Self-scourging was common as well as other forms of self-inflicted bodily pain designed to subdue the urgings and promptings of the flesh. In other words, physical mistreatment of the body was designed to facilitate the experience of a perfect nudity of your spirit. Inner freedom from all worldly concerns or fleshly desires. Wow. Woo, we need, to, we need help. Jesus, Lord, help us. Forgive us and help us, Lord. Help us. Oh, check this out. Number eight of 10 reasons, uh, or should I say 10 things you need to know about mysticism. Mysticism and Christianity are mixed up. Just get on YouTube and Facebook and listen to all these people that are bent toward Christianity and talking about all their mystic experiences. Woo! It's happening on a channel near you. Hey, what about this, sis? The mystic's experience of God's presence is so intense and personal that it can be described in merely cognitive terms as in knowing or understanding. In other words, mystical experience is ineffable. It is thus described either by means of metaphors drawn from the five senses, especially seeing, smelling, tasting, smelling, and warmth and heat. And, and they're going to be the, the warmth and heat, the two most common images employed or in erotic sensual terms. What does that tell you? Ooh, yeah. Isn't that... It, I mean, how, how can you not understand if you truly have the spirit of the Most High God in you, Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of holiness, that that is profane. There's a difference between holiness and profaneness. And when yes. you start bringing in erotic, sensual terms and feelings, bodily sensations, you're talking about profanity and profaning the Spirit yes. of God. How dare you uncircumcised Philistines come against my God 
and and say that which is holy is profane and that which is profane is holy it's 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 sick is what it is and um at this point you know folks are gonna defend what they believe and that's fine you believe whatever you want to i'm just giving you the facts here uh, mystics wow. insist that their mode of access to god is radically different from traditional forms such as prayer the sacraments the word and other religious rituals they argue that God does indeed become present in and through these activities, but not in any direct or immediate way. God's presence for the mystic is unmeditated and direct. Now, I want to show you something here. God's presence for the mystic is unmeditated and direct. So I can immediately tap into this spirit. Okay, when you tap into something, you're tapping into something. It's divination. Okay, yeah. when you're when you are talking about absorbing yourself into God, and it's all about God and contemplating God and about God, that is in direct opposition to the Word of God. The Word of God says, "Meditate on the Word of God." You hear me? Yes. Yes, I agree. We're supposed to be meditating on the Word of God. We're not supposed to be contemplating God. There's a difference. Yes, yes. It takes us back to transcendental meditation. I'm not going to go in there right now, but just stick a pin in that. Transcendental meditation. This yeah. mysticism, it's finite realities, whether verbal, concrete, visual, etc., are an adequate means to communicate the infinite. Genu and, and this, again, genuine contact with God, therefore, requires relating to him and in him through a new dimension that transcends the created order. That is, that sentence right there is totally demonic, okay? Yes. Genuine contact with God, therefore, requires relating to him in him through a new dimension that transcends the created order. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yes. And Dubai explains this is what the Christian mystic means when he or she says that we reach God through unknowing. I don't know about y'all, but my, my Bible says I can know God and be known of God. He said, I knew you before I formed you in the womb. This is, this is not Christianity. But if you bring mysticism into Christendom, you've got something that's mixed up. Mixed up. Big time. Big time mixed up. If we reach God through unknowing, we, now listen, we penetrate into the divine by a divine gift, not through an oriental process such as Buddhist meditation or, or, or a set of, of uh, techniques. But this is saying mysticisms enter into God through no human means, no methods, no ideas, what is occasionally were referred to as idealess knowing. How can how can we not understand that that is not holy? The true experience of God's presence and love is not something attainable by utilizing human reasoning, such as observation, deduction, induction, inference, implication, or any form of intellectually based proofs. Rather, it is by a direct infusion from God himself that engages the spiritual rather than the mental center of the individual. How about we just be born again of spirit and water and be filled with the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of holiness? Exactly. Number 10. Okay. There are several dangers of mysticism. We've touched on a few, but let's go a little bit further. Mysticism and Christendom. It can't mix because then you're mixing the holy with the profane. You cannot mix any of it. It's like putting poop in your brownies. Exactly. The whole batch is contaminated. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. 